Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Oh no, Terrell. I'm outnumbered. I got two New Yorkers. I'm the sole West Coast representative here, Southeast, Southwest guy. So I might need a translator, but I think I think we'll be able to figure out most of this stuff. Listen, we'll we're gonna curse and you. we're we'll and we're loud. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Larry. We'll talk slower for you. It's fine. We'll slow it down. Yeah, I'm just gonna hit mute now and just not even try. Listen, today we have Larry Sharp. Okay, he's a business consultant, entrepreneur, podcaster. Okay, he's a host of a podcast, The Sharp Way. I've been on the show. If you haven't, uh, go back and watch it on YouTube. Uh, the other thing, he is a prior governor candidate in 2022, and hopefully he will be running again in 2026. Uh, we definitely need him here in New York. I'm just happy to, happy to meet you, one. And then I find out he's been low carb longer than I have. He's been low carb. So Larry, awesome to have you here. Help us understand how you got started in sort of your, your own health journey, your own health space. Maybe you could even talk us how you got into politics um, and then maybe mix the two and see what happens. Well, let's see. Let's hope it's exciting. The, the me getting into keto is actually a sad story that ends well. What do I mean by that? 2010 was the worst year of my life, hands down. And my father passed away when I was a kid. That was the worst year of my life. But until then, it was 2010. 2010, my youngest daughter uh, had just been born and she had heart problems and was going at uh, having open heart surgery at 18 days old. We thought we were going to lose her. We thought it was over. We thought that we, we thought we were going to lose her. We thought we, I was going to lose my daughter. And so, of course, my wife, as any wife would do, packed up and moved into the hospital. So she just packed up and left, moved to the hospital. I get it. I'm not mad at her. Any mom would do that. The problem for me was all of a sudden I had a six-year-old daughter at the time that was still at home. I became a single dad overnight and I was not the primary caregiver. At the same time, I'm losing my daughter. I'm now becoming a single dad overnight, which was you know terrible for me to figure out how to do that, right? And my wife is not there to assist because she is 100% focused on my youngest daughter. On top of that, the same week, my mother gets diagnosed with stage four cancer. On top of that, my business is finally collapsing at the 2009 crash. I had tried to hold on for as long as I could. I had fired my employees, had to shut my office down, and it was all over. My business was collapsing. So my business is collapsing. My wife is gone. I'm a single dad overnight. My daughter is dying. My mom is dying. Clearly, I, I literally contemplated suicide. That is how bad I felt. I thought the world was ending. I had no control. I thought this was the worst it could possibly be. Well, I don't really drink. I don't smoke. I don't do any of that stuff. So what did I do? I ate. I ate my feelings. I just ate. And I poured on weight. I put on like 20 pounds in like I don't know, two months. I mean, something insane. I just, I just was poor. I was eating. And I remember I was in such a state of denial that I would eat an entire pizza and a two liter of Coke for lunch and think, that's normal. Everybody, right? Everyone does that, right? So I, I just, I would not. And the problem is my wife wasn't there. So she wasn't there to go, Larry, what are you doing? There was no one there to go, what are you doing? And my wife wasn't there for me to lean on her for this because she was in with all of her own issues. So I couldn't lean on her with all my issues. And the worst part is most of my friends at the time were business associates. So I didn't want them to know my business was collapsing because I was trying to rebuild it. So I couldn't share with them either. So I had no support structure to deal with these issues. And I was eating everything and in such denial that I couldn't see how bad it was. I couldn't understand I was gaining weight until literally something happened to me. How I was quickly did you getting, gain weight? How quickly did you gain weight? I'm just curious. I gained about 20 pounds, about a month and a half, two months. Wow. Yeah, I, just, I was eating everything. I was eating all of the food. <laughs> And I was like, give me all of it. I will eat it all. I poured the weight on. And so then all of a sudden, I'm trying to get my act together. I'm trying to get it back in action. And I've got to go back out into the city and try to make money again and rebuild. So I finally pull my you know, self up, shave, and I try to put my suit on. I can't fit any of my suits. 
I'm so big, I cannot physically fit into any of my suits. And I'm like, that was my light bulb. Like I was so in such denial and my brain was so shut off that I put on 20 pounds and I couldn't, I didn't see it. Like I just did not see it. I put my, I try to close my suit. Like what? Oh my God, I put on too much weight. So at that point, I'm like, now I can't go make money. Now I got a problem. I got to do something now. I got I to gotta act. I, I got to do something. And that was my wake up moment right then and there. As silly as that sounds, that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And when that happened, I said, okay, I knew a couple of things. I'm a consultant. I deal with people, human behavior. I know that diets don't work. I knew that. I always knew that. It's got to be a lifestyle change. Lifestyle change is all that works. That's how you make change your life about lifestyle change, habitual changes. And I thought, okay, let me try to coach myself here, right? How do, how do I deal with this? So no diet. It's got to be something that I can do. And two things that had to be. It had to be simple, but not easy. What I mean by that is simple to handle, but challenging to complete, but simple to understand. So I thought, well, I could count calories. That's what I thought. I thought, ah, I'm, that's too much math and stuff. I don't want to play that game. I'll screw that up. I'll, I'll, I'll mess that up. I, thought, I could become a gym rat. I can just work out like six times a day. I just burn everything off. There's no tomorrow. I could try that. I thought, but that's not my lifestyle, right? Because I'm a consultant. I can't create, I'll always have an excuse. I'll never make it happen. I thought, no carb, low carb. That's what I'll do. I don't have to think. It's just don't eat carbs. So it's simple, but it's challenging because if it's challenging, when I achieve something, I will feel like I've achieved something and I'll keep going, right? So I knew that psychologically, I got to trick myself into that. So I thought, all right, I'll try that. So I was fanatical. And when I say fanatical, I was fanatical on no carb. Literally for the first, for when I started this, I was eating like steak, bacon, eggs, coffee, water. That's it. Like nothing else. I was fanatical. Now that may not be the best diet to have in the world, but it was the best diet for my brain. Because when I was that fanatical, that crystal clear, I dropped 40 pounds in two months, the more than two months. I went 20 pounds behind what I was. So I'd gained 20 pounds and I went down 20 more pounds than that. I just, the weight, weight fell off me. At my height, I was 230. I went down to 190. I just dropped weight. It just fell off me because I was just so fanatical. And the glory of this was once I was able to see some success, that gave me the confidence to take care of other things in my life. Once I saw that success, that's what made me go, you know what? Let me try to take care of my relationship, which is falling apart too. Let me take care of my, my daughter. Let me take care of my business. Let me take care of other things. Because at that point in my life, I felt like I had no control over anything. And controlling my diet just gave me the ability to go, I can do other stuff. I'm not a total loser. I felt like a complete loser. And then that gave me the, pe the pieces to move next. From that, I became less fanatical. However, there were a lot of issues with this. You might say, Larry, why would you even think that? Because years ago, back before uh, 2000, about around 2000, I'm sorry, I was in the health food industry. I started a business that was actually selling health food, nutritional products into franchise GNCs and, um, and individually owned stores. And when I was doing that, I was learning about, back then it was called Atkins, right? That was the Atkins thing. And everybody thought Atkins was crazy. And I was watching people who were doing it and it was working. But I never thought it was a big deal. I never thought it was important to me. My weight wasn't that important to me then. I thought I was finding care. But I went back to it after, um, after when I needed it. And why did I get into that in the first place? All right. Am, am I yapping too much or am I good? No, no, no. Keep going. That's all right. So how did I get to the idea of being in the health uh, industry in the first place? Years before that, I was a Marine. And when I was in the Marine Corps, I ate terribly. But it didn't matter. Because I was 18 and super active. It did not matter what I ate. I could have Burger King and pizza and garbage and who cares. And I stayed thin because literally I was walking everywhere, running five times a week, three miles every day, five times a week, marching when I was out in the field. I mean, I was just always, always doing stuff. So I didn't care what I ate. And of course, being that young, I didn't know that that was the reason why I was thin. I just thought, ah, I'm just... I'm just naturally thin because I'm cool like that. That's what I thought. Well, when I got out after seven years of being a Marine, I became a teacher. Way different lifestyle. 
Well, I didn't think I'd have eaten it differently. I could still eat like garbage. Who cares? I eat like garbage. It doesn't matter. And I did. And I blew up. And I got big, of course. And of course, about a year or two, I put on about 20 to 30 pounds. About a year or two. I put on about 20 to 30 pounds. And I was like, wow. And how did I know this? Because I was playing around. And I wanted to go back into my uniforms. And yet again, it hit. I can't fit into any of my uniforms. Oh, my God. Okay, something's up. With that one, though, I didn't go to low carb uh, at, at, at that point. I had spent more time on exercise and cutting down portion control. And that seemed to work decently for me. And I kept my weight at, at a decent level. But then when I then came into Atkins, I realized, oh, what was I doing? I was actually unknowingly, I was cutting back carbs back then. I wasn't doing purposefully. I just wound up doing it because I was trying to lose weight, eat less. I wound up eating less carbs by default, not knowing. When I found out what Atkins was in the late 90s, like, oh, I was doing Atkins. I didn't even know that. I was doing, I was I was good at cutting carbs, but I didn't know any better. And then when I needed it, that's when I fell back to it. So I think that's I, how I got into the carb, the no carb world. Can I can I ask you a question? So you, you talked about a very sort of tender moment where you know, life hit you with everything all at once. And you mentioned that you were stress eating. Yes. You, know, you mentioned, yeah, you, you said I was eating my emotions, 100%. right? And I'm just curious when you're, you're in that moment, how cognizant are you that you're eating your emotions? Is it, does, you know, does a light bulb go on like months later when somebody mentions your weight? Does it, what, does it go on months later when clothes aren't fitting? Like what, at what point, Sounds like when you go back, you are somewhat cognizant of it. Like when you're eating that pizza, do you know like you're emotionally eating? What's what's going on there? Here's the issue. Emotional eating works. I wish it didn't, but it does. When I would shove that pizza and that soda in my mouth, I felt better. It absolutely worked. I wish it didn't, but it did. And all I wanted was the pain to go away. That's what I wanted. And when I had that pizza and when I drank that soda, the pain did go away. The sad part is it came back. And when it yeah. came back, I had to eat more. And when it came back, it's, it's like a drug, right? So when I'm jonesing for my drug, I don't care what you think. I'm jonesing for my drug, right? I want my drug. I don't care what you think. I want my drug. I, I think this is pain. such a huge right. thing, Larry. Like what you're saying is like it gives me goosebumps looking at it because – Back in the day, five years ago, Troy, I think we're now we talked about this and, you know, Rob Sybis and I talked about and Troy brought up the, the whole thing of addiction and food and how this all works. And we got attacked by a doctor who's been wrong on every front, every front. The guy has to be paid by a lot of pharma and all these things because he's been wrong on everything. 100 yeah. percent wrong. But anyways, he said we should have our license taken for even discussing that food has a role in emotions. I'm like, exactly when you said, hey, I didn't turn to oh alcohol, God. drugs, smoking, things like that, because I turned to food. And so many of us do that. And and yes. Jane Bullen just gave a talk. And I was like, wow, because she said, name another animal besides humans who will eat when they're stressed. If you take your dog and you put them in a stressful environment, they're not eating. You could put all the food yeah. in front of them you want. They're not eating. Right. right. They're not saying, oh, I'll have a cookie. I'll eat it. But for us, exactly what you said is we and I and I looked at the data, the research shows that we get a dopamine serotonin release when we eat these kind of foods. When you're stressed and tense and don't sleep because your body's telling you a disaster is coming, you better store fats. Right. So when people are chronically stressed and not sleeping, you crave inherently sugar yeah. and fat together, like all these things that we're talking about. So you feel better for a minute. But what happens is you need more and more of that stimulus to get that same effect. So having one piece of pizza is not going to do it. Now you need five pieces. That's why. Yep. People who are emotionally stable say, I have half a cookie and I'm good. I just wanted to taste it. And I don't need to eat the whole dozen. <laughs> right. So it's so I love pizza, saying. but I don't have to eat anymore. You're right. But someone like you, you make the point you're disciplined. You're a Marine. There's no one more disciplined than Marines and tougher and, and you know, you know, put it all on the line and deal with stress, too. Right. Like when you're putting your butt on the line. But going through the emotional stress and family stress. And this is what I've been raising for the last five years, too, is that. These guys do mice studies. They go, you give them 300 calories of this and they do fine. It's like, well, they're not going through what you went through with having a, a sick right. daughter that you're going to lose. Your, your relationship is falling apart. Mom's sick. You got all these things happening, right? And say, okay, Larry, just eat 500 calories a day and you'll lose weight. Well, it's not that easy when you're stressed and depressed and anxious. So thank you for that because I, I just want to make that point because your story is perfect to discuss these topics. 100%. And and to your your question, Troth, did I see it? Does an addict see it? Right. And I think the thing is true. Yes, but no. I know my mom was an addict. My mom actually was, was a convicted uh, felon 
uh, she was an addict and went to prison. And I know what it's like. When someone is jonesing, they don't care. Seeing it or not is irrelevant. Once they're satiated, yes, they do care. When, when do you want to get an addict to get help? Not when they're jonesing. You actually want them to get, get help when they're high. I know it sounds dumb, but that's reality, right? Because that's when they'll hear you. Because now they're not jonesing anymore. They'll actually hear you when they're high. They won't hear you when they're not high because they want to get their drug. So after I would eat, there was a terrible cycle. And the cycle was, I would feel better. But then I'd say, all right, what am I doing? Right, what am I doing? Because now my head was clear because I was feeling better. Right, part of the reason, and this is something I'm sure you all, I'm, I'm pretty choir here, but your audience may not, might not know this. Part of the reason why we eat when we're stressed, one aspect of stress is a lack of focus because everything's happening. We're not focused on the task, focus on the thing, whatever the thing is. So our brain has to keep working so much. The brain is begging for energy, right, to keep doing that. And then energy, as you said, obviously is sugar and or fat or some combination, right? It wants that desperately. Well, once I get all that 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 fat in my me and all that and that sugar and all that salt, I get everything inside of me. All of a sudden, I start focusing. I, it would work. Like, that's my point. It does work, right? So I, it would start to work. And I thought going, okay, now what am I doing? But the problem was when the pain came back, I had no way of satiating the pain. And there'd be a trigger of pain, like my wife isn't here anymore, right? My mom's going to die next week, right? Those, that pain would, and I, and I then would no longer care. And I go right back into eating. And because my brain didn't want to accept the fact that I was addicted, it would simply make up a story that I wasn't. Right? Just, it would just make up a story. Oh, no, no, you're not addicted. You're, ju you're just satiating it right now. You're just hungry. Everybody does this. This is normal. This is natural, right? When, whenever we know as humans that we're wrong or we're not sure we're right, we look to social proof to validate our bad behavior, right? It's a common thing humans do. We use, we use social proof. Is that is anyone else doing it? Okay, then it must be okay, right? I'm I'm gonna go out and do a bad thing. Is everyone else doing a bad thing? Oh, okay, well, they're all doing it, so I can do it. It's okay now. And I did that. I looked for other people who were doing it and they were doing it, so clearly I'm okay. It validated my bad behavior. So I hope I answered both of your questions. Yeah, and, amazing. Oh, sorry, last piece. Amazing. The thing I didn't notice, there was, there was a point where I had to stop. In the case of my mom, it was jail. That was the, holy crap, what am I doing? Right, that was hers. Mine was a whole lot less. It was, I can't go out and make money. I physically cannot fit in my suits. I had nothing to wear to go meet people to try to go make money. That was my, Larry, what are you doing? What have you been doing? This doesn't, I got to do something else. But I'll then move to your point, Dr. Brian, with the, um, the idea of discipline. I believe discipline is a muscle and you have to exercise it. And I would often tell my wife, as I was teasing her, she would say, are you going to do this one thing? I would say, yes, because I'm disciplined. And I would say that. Why would I say that? She doesn't care. <laughs> doesn't care. No one else cares. I would say it to tell myself that, right? To tell myself that. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking to myself when I say that, right? I say it out loud, but that's so I hear myself say it. Because I know there's an influence law called the influence law of consistency. And what that means is how I act in front of others, I want to act, right? I don't want to say things that aren't true. So I'm going to say I'm disciplined, so I don't have to act disciplined. I would tell my wife or my daughter things that I would do. Not because they care. They, they were like, okay, great. But I would say it so I could, I'd, I'd have to achieve it. Otherwise, I'd have to go back to them and go, yeah, I was full of crap, right? So I have to do it. So I believe discipline is a muscle. So I would say these things and I would set goals that, that to achieve. But I would often set small goals. I'm not a huge goal setter guy. I like small goals to achieve them and then keep going. I also like things to be very specific. So let me give you a piece that I dealt with. And I think most people, when they first start to deal with this, and me, it's the idea of feeling like you're never going to have good food again. I had that, right? When I first thought this, I was like, oh my God, am I never going to have ice cream? Am I I'm going to feel deprived. Why should I deprive myself? I had all those feelings. So what I did was I made a specific thing and I said, okay, I am going to be on keto until, and I would put a specific date and time, like this Friday at noon, I'm going to break and I can break for 
two hours. I'm making that up till 2 p.m. Why was that good for me? That may not work for everybody, but it worked tremendously for me because then I said to myself, oh, so no, no, I can have ice cream or I can have pizza, but I have to wait till Friday at noon. Then if I want to, I could have it. And I would usually connect it to something social because clearly eating is social. So whenever I would break, I connected to something social, like it's going to be my wife's birthday or it's going to be a party or it's going to be a blah, blah, blah. And I give myself an hour or two where I wanted to eat whatever I wanted. And what I found was initially that would satiate me to get there. But when I got there, I would binge. I would eat all of the ice cream and all of the pizza and I would binge. Now, that was good and bad. Why was it bad? Because binging obviously is bad. But it was good because then I felt like crap after. And I learned my lesson the hard way. I felt like crap after binging. And after the second time of doing that, I stopped. So I I had to go through two rounds of binging before I was like, you know what? This is not, I feel worse. Everything's bad. I feel like crap. And I feel like I cheated afterwards. Although like I felt bad on all those things, right? So I I initially, I, I, I went, I'm not doing it anymore. So I still do that. Like I'm keto, except like, for example, Thanksgiving dinner, I will very often just eat whatever. But because my lifestyle is not keto, I don't want to eat 14 pounds of potatoes. So I don't. I'll eat a little bit with everybody else. I might have a toast with a drink with some beer with everybody for that night. I might do that, but that's about it. So it's very rare. So even now, I'm going to say many years later, even now when I break, and I only break a couple times a year, literally. When I do that, I don't even eat that much of other stuff. But I do. I sometimes I will have a slice of pizza probably, you know, once or twice a year when my daughter has a pizza party or something, maybe. Sometimes I don't do that either. But the next thing begins to happen is people begin to know who you are, right? Initially, when you don't have the food socially with others, people start going, why is Larry not eating? Why Why, why is he not eating? What's Is he mad? Does he not like the food, Right. But then as people know you, then people go, oh, oh, no, no, he's keto. He's not going to eat that stuff. Like they they do that, right? And then it becomes okay. Like people know that I'm keto. I tease when I ran on my, when I was running for governor, I would say I survive on protein and caffeine. That's how I have so much energy, right? People say, Larry, how can you do five events a day? How can you keep going on for days on end? How do you do that? I say protein and caffeine. That's it. That's all I eat. So people know that now. So eventually over time, people know who you are. And they don't get offended or insulted. In fact, sometimes I've had people, I remember someone actually gave me a gift. They gave me a keto cheesecake as a gift, one of my people supporters. They begin to know who you are and they don't get upset anymore. But initially, sometimes people get upset because why aren't you eating my potato salad, right? You don't like my potato salad? They do get some of that, but eventually over time they get it. And when I say I'm going to no carb lifestyle, I don't say diet. I say lifestyle. I never use the phrase diet. I say lifestyle because it is a lifestyle for me. And, and when you, I and, say that, they change. And you raise so many great points. Uh, you know, I was going to say Tro and Larry at the same time, but Tro and I are nodding our head the whole time, right? Because we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, because what you're saying is so true. What you're saying is, look, even if I'm going to binge at Friday night at this meeting or whatever it's going to be, uh, you're in control of that. Be planned ahead. Yes. So a lot of people go into it, go, okay, I'm not going to eat anything at that meeting. And then they go and they eat all this crappy food and then they're out of control. And then they go, I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. Then the next two months they're eating terrible food and they're yep. off rails. So doing it one time and all the time people come in and go, you know, they'll say, Hey, are you going to be upset? I've been doing so great, but I'm going out with the girls Friday night. And I'm going to drink wine and have pizza with them. What do you think? I was like, this is great news. Are you kidding me? Why? You planned it. You thought about yes. it. Yes. You don't just get there and get out of control. And so, so many of the things you're saying are so critical. And the other thing that's critical that you're saying is that when you say I'm a disciplined person, I have a lot of patients say, I'm just lazy. I'm just a procrastinator. I just don't plan ahead. That's me. That's how I am. It's like, well, we we need to get you disciplined to say, okay, I'm going to plan ahead for that event that's coming up. And so, so many times we tell ourselves, I'm just a glutton. I'm just lazy. I can't exercise. I hate exercise. Like, well, just go for a little walk and see if you enjoy it a little bit. Just do 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 something along the positive realm. Uh, and so, so much of so much of what you're saying is so critical. Sorry, Toad, jump in, man. No, no. I, I, one other thing I I noted just to add on because I agree with everything you said is he identified right. Like so, a big part of changing right is identifying. Like I am addicted, right? like for me, carbs are harmful, not for everybody. I'm not saying it's harmful for everybody. For me, carbs are harmful. And he identified, I'm addicted. I'm an addict. I know what I am, what I need, right? 
And not only did he identify it, he was so strong in his self-identification that other people were very clear on what it is. Larry doesn't do this. Larry does this. And they support you, all that emotional stuff, social stuff that, that gets in between, you know, uh, uh, sort of moves out of the way because you identified with your problem. I don't do carbs. You know, I don't, I don't eat sugar, right? That's it. And that's so critical to conquering, I think, you know, if I can get a patient, I think every patient with diabetes should identify as somebody harmed by carbs, right? That would be the easiest way. Well, it's the funniest okay. thing too, Tro, is that like if you invite a vegan friend over and they're not eating the steak, you don't get upset with them. You're like, oh, you're vegan. You don't eat this. But with cookies and candy and you don't eat, people get upset because like I put all that time into making that. Well, I don't eat that, <laughs> right? Well, maybe if you made it, possibly. But if you bought it from the store and you know went to Costco and bought it, I'm not going to eat it, right? So sometimes you you just kind of pick your poison, like you said, and, and just kind of weigh the risk and benefit. And you go, okay, if you have like you said, pizza twice or three times a, a year, and then you're good and you can enjoy your life. And it's a long-term goal, not just looking good for the wedding. And then after that, you go back to your old ways that cause right. all the problems that you have, right? right? That's what happens all the time. No, the, the point you brought up, Joe, is so good. You you talk about the idea of, 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 you know, accepting that you're an addict. I got this idea, believe it or not, because if you're any, any veterans out there know that there's a lot of guys who drink in the, in the military, a lot. So I know a lot of guys who are alcoholics, right? I know a lot of them. And when they say, no, no, uh, uh, you know, I'm an AA, or for those of you who know about AA, they often will give you um, a coin, right? That's like one year sober, two years sober, that kind of thing. And many people who are part of that will just show you the coin. That's a common thing that people will do. Show you, or, they'll, or they'll literally, when you give them a drink, they'll put the coin in the drink. Literally, they'll just put the coin right in there, boink, put it right in the drink. And that lets you know, oh, got it. No drinking for you. Got it. And no one, to your point, Dr. Brian, no one gets upset. No one gets angry. They go, oh, dude doesn't drink. Okay, got it. He got some issues. He doesn't drink. Probably has some problems. Let me walk away from that. Okay, got it. Done. That's it. And that, and knowing so many men like that is kind of how I took it as, no, 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 I know. Because what I, it's a funny story I'll tell you. My, my, I love, love carb-filled sugary soda. Love it. Coke. Pepsi, 7-Up, don't care, Mountain Dew, you name it. I love it. Like there's no tomorrow, I love it. I would chug that stuff every day if I could. If it wouldn't kill me, I would absolutely chug it every day. I love it so much. And it's nothing but poison for you, nothing but bad, nothing but bad, but I love it. So one day, this is years ago, my wife is trying to be good to me and she buys two, two liters of Pepsi and puts it in the fridge. And I got mad at her. I said, why'd you do that? She goes, well, you like soda, so I will get some extra. I said, now I got to drink two liters tonight. <laughs> Why'd you do that? And I said that openly. And when I said that, I thought to myself, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. Like, that was my, I still remember it when I said it. I, I was actually angry at her. Like, how dumb is that, me being angry at my wife for being good to me because she knows I like something, so she buys more of it so I can have it for more, and I'm angry. What an idiot, right? I thought, no, no, it's not that I'm an idiot. I'm an addict. That's a That's huge, huge point too. Cause so many of my patients will come and go, you know what? I did terrible this week. Cause my husband went out and he bought a big ba bag of candy. It's like, did he force it down your, th what, what happened? Did he hold you down and shove it in your mouth or what, how, what did he do for that? Right. Cause you can look at it and go, I'm not doing that. If you go certain things, if you're vegan, you don't say I'm going to eat a steak just cause my husband bought steak. So you go, okay, I got to get this mindset. And this is one thing that we've been really looking at. What's your mindset you're going into it and saying, okay, I'm going to enjoy the ride and not say once I lose 30 pounds, I'll be happy. So you go, I feel better. And, and the other thing I, I just wanted to bring back and then I'll be quiet for a while, but, uh, when you were talking about being suicidal, you're looking around and going, everything sucks. It's like you're in a country song, you know, where everyone loses all their stuff and everything's going terrible. Yeah. Uh, how much of that attitude was based on what you were eating to 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 calm your nerves? And how much when you got into a good diet plan where you cut out the processed food and sugars, when you start seeing the world a little better and going, hey, maybe it's not so bad. And that was one thing in the movie Fat Fiction. Five of my patients were up there talking about their depression, anxiety, stress got better with changing their diet for, because they got diabetes and they didn't want to have diabetes. And then all of a sudden they're like, I'm happy again. Like that was the side effect. And when we talked about that, we got attacked, but we were seeing it clinically in our practices that people were smiling again and happy and come in and they're like, wow, you look really good. Like not because they lost weight because they were, they had a different eyes. They're just seeing their eyes without seeing the rest of their body go, wow, they're like happy. They have life back again. And it's amazing to see that. There's many points to this. 
um, if I may. The first part is, and I'm sorry if I'm dominating, guys. I just, I, I love the topic, so you give me a chance to talk about it. And I don't often talk about it on my podcast, so I'm totally taking advantage of your podcast to talk about it. So I apologize, but I just, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that I can talk about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my podcast is is usually cultural politics. So I get to actually talk about this. I'm, I'm happy to to speak about it. When it's twofold, Dr. Brian. The first one is, at first, no. Because at first, I was just using it as a drug. And it actually became a spiral for me. Right? To your point earlier, one slice is good enough. Now I need two. And now I need three. Before you know it, I'm eating an entire, and I'm not joking, I would eat the entire, the entire pizza in one lunch sitting. It just kept getting worse. And at that point, I wasn't feeling better long term at all. I was feeling out of control. But I was temporarily getting rid of my pain. And it made me understand a bit more how people who are very, very, very big, how they got there. Because if I hadn't have changed my lifestyle, I would have been there, right? I was going there. That was my goal, my, my trajectory. I was going right towards that because I, I, instead of fixing my problems, I was just temporarily taking the pain away. So the problems were never getting fixed. I was still feeling terrible. So I just had to eat more and then I felt more terrible. So I had to eat more and it just kept going. So doing the doing the the, the keto piece, and again, I in my mind, I believe, and when I ask people to do things, I always do as, as a trainer and a coach, I often try to get them to do a simple task that is not easy. Because if I just thinking on one thing, just do this one simple thing, make this thing happen, I will have a success Dopamine shoots up from success, not from other bad habit. So I can get the dopamine fix from the success and then move on. So I think part of it was, yes, once I cut out the carbs, I wasn't sluggish. I had energy. I, I was focused. Absolutely true. That all worked. And I have to add on top of that, I was having successes, which made it even stronger. If that makes any sense, right? The fact that I had a better diet I was now reinforced by having successes. So I said I would do the thing. I said I would not eat carbs for a day. I would do that 24 hours. No carbs, 24 hours. I would do 24 hours. I did it. Oh my God, I felt better. And I had no carbs. So it kept, but then I go one step further. And this is an elitist piece that some people feel. And you see it with people who are like vegans, uh, people vegetarians, uh, people on keto, people who are gluten-free, is it a thing? If there aren't many people doing it and you're doing it, you feel good about yourself. You just do, right? Not everybody can be gluten-free like me. Everybody can be keto like me. Everybody can be vegan like me, right? I'm cool because I'm the thing that other people aren't. So part of that was me being keto. Also, if you're like, oh, a lot of people aren't keto. Oh, I'm special because I'm the keto guy. So I'm special. So I think all of those things combined did exactly what you said. It wasn't only the diet. It was a diet, obviously. But on top of that, it was the successes. And on top of that was the idea of saying, I'm doing something that other people aren't doing. So it makes me special because of the thing. It's like the one person who gets the doctorate when none of their friends get a doctorate degree, right? The one person who becomes this when no one else becomes it, right? That, that you feel like you're special because you've done the thing that other people haven't done, whatever that might be. So I think it, I think it was all three of those, if that makes any sense. The few and the proud, right? Being a Marine, absolutely. <laughs> Makes me special, right? right? You go, hey, Marine. not everyone can do what I've done. And when you go through life like that, then you get confidence in the next next hurdle that comes up. Absolutely. You know, I want to I wanna ask you, so, so you've been low carb for 13 years. At yep. some point, some doctor must have said, Larry, you're running for governor. You can't be doing this, you know, or Larry, All the time. unhealthy. So what, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah. I, um, the funny part is I don't go to doctors anymore. So, and I'll tell you a good story. Um, I only go to doctors when I'm running for office. So I have health records in case the public asks my health records. So I go to the doctor every four years. Otherwise, I don't go to the doctor anymore. Um, and so when I go, they always tell me every time they try to get me on two or three types of drugs. Every time. Some form of statin or some form of something drug for some, always something. They're always going to get me on drugs, always. And I always go, okay, great, great. And I walk away and never come back. Um, I, cause I know I'm okay. How do I know I'm okay? Because I went last year cause I ran for governor last year. And when I went to the doctor last year, which is the first time in four years, cause I ran last time in 2018, 
when I went to the doctor and I go to the uh, the, the reception, they have to have you fill out all the forms, right? And the receptionist says, I'm sorry, sir, you have to fill out your prescriptions. I said, I don't have any. They went, what? I said, I don't have any. Oh, okay. Now the nurse takes me in, right? When I go to the room for the nurse, she goes, sorry, so you forgot to write your prescriptions down. I said, I don't have any. What? What? Then, okay. Doctor comes in. Sorry, sir, you have to put in your prescriptions. I don't have any. They could not believe that a man in his 50s did not have prescriptions. They couldn't believe it. Like three people assumed that I was somehow lying or forgot it. I'm sure they yelled at the receptionist for not having her, her having put my prescriptions on it, right? And so, yes, I am always told that I'm in trouble. I'm, I have a problem. I have everything, blah, blah. Somehow I've maintained my weight. Somehow I've maintained, I'm, I'm able to, 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 to run for office. I'm able to retain my family, do everything I need to do. No prescriptions, no nothing. And as you know, Dr. Tro, my breakfast every morning is bacon and eggs. Every morning is bacon and eggs and has been for years. Every morning. And my, my, and my daughter came home once and told me, Daddy, you can't eat so many eggs. I said, why? She goes, I learned in school, I'm not joking, that one egg is the equivalent of five cigarettes. Oh, my God. They told, she told her. I said, I said, is that right? I said, man, how come I don't have lung cancer already? She was like, what? I said, you know, you eggs every day. She's like, I know you do. I said, yeah, your school's full of crap. It's not true. None of it's true. But yes. So I get that all the time. Yes. You take our joy People away, Larry. Nuts. I love yes. to see these huge, crazy med lists that come in. I'm like, okay, we're going to take all these off. Like, you don't need yes. all these things. So we're going to, like, we just have to, like, if we we work together, we get rid of stuff. And so it's yep. fun for Cho and I looking and going, oh, this one causes this side effects. You're taking this drug for the heartburn that this other one caused. And then, you know, when you start looking at this whole picture, if we get the stress and sleep and all this metabolic health stuff right, then you never want to see us again. You go, I feel healthy. What am I going to do? If you were my patient, I'm like, Larry, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> you're doing, you're healthy. You're doing great. You know, but sometimes it's hard when you everyone says you're going to get sick, you're going to die. And you keep hearing this over and over again. It's so taxing for people. And like people all the time go, I didn't want to go in because every time I go in, my doctor gets yelling at me about something. And, you know, and and they're nice people, but, uh, you know, they're they're taking their own health in their own hands and they're looking at the data and they're getting the right studies done and, and figuring out life stress and sleep and all that. That's kind of been my big jumping block right now, because, again, so many people. They come home from a stressful job and they're pissed off mm -hmm. and they go and they go, I'm going to go look at the computer for two hours and ignore their family or they're going to go play video games or they're going to drink alcohol or they're going to like go read or do whatever you do. And it's like hard because so many people just are not engaging uh, and and that's their drug of choice, whatever it becomes. In your case, it was food, but other people, it's something else, maybe, you know, yes. smoking or alcohol or whatever it is to deal with that. And that's video why, games, something. Yeah. And Pro and I, Tro brought this up, and I'm like, "What the heck is Tro talking about?" Five years ago, saying, "I have all these guys quitting pornography, having more sex with their partner. What is that about?" I'm like, "Well, maybe it's a testosterone, maybe, but maybe that's a way of dealing with stress that they go, okay, and I can escape for an hour and you know relieve myself or whatever.' But the rest of us are saying, "Hey, look, how do I? Maybe I go for a walk with my wife and talk about life and go look at the birds or do something else more productive, you know?" Yeah, well, you, it, you brought up the productive piece, and and that's the thing that I, I think is why things like video games and things like that, watching shows is, is addictive because there's purpose behind it, right? One thing I found, and this is just a personal thing, I don't know if it works for everybody, but it definitely works for me, which is I don't like going for walks. That's not a thing I enjoy. I like going to do things. I want a mission. So what do I do? I volunteer to go to the grocery shopping. Why? I, I live in Queens. We walk to the grocery store and walk back, right? So I give myself a reason to go do the, the physical thing versus just going, you should walk every day. That's not going to work for me. Some people, maybe they like walking. It's great. I don't like doing a thing to do the thing. I like doing a thing for a reason, whatever that reason is. So the, the advantage, there are many disadvantages of living in New York City, but there are some advantages. And the advantage is you can walk to everything that you need to go to. You can do so, right? My computer repair guy is walking distance. My accountant is walking distance. My dentist is walking distance, right? So I can walk. To, my bank is walking distance. So I purposely will do the chores on a daily or weekly basis so that I can get out and constantly be walking. That I happily do. But if you just said, Larry, walk every day, I'd be like, for what? Why? To hear the birds. I open a window. What are you doing? Uh, right. It's just it. It doesn't move me if that makes any sense. 
So I purposely give myself reasons to do the healthy things so I can do the healthy things. I think there's some enjoyment to movement though. You know, there's something to be said about movement. And sh I did not realize you're a Queens person. My wife's gonna love you. She's, uh, she's also from Queens. So you're in Queens now? Yes, I'm in oh, Astoria man. as we speak. We're gonna get together for a steak then wait, soon. Wait, I have a question. I'm in. How could Larry not like walking around and looking busy and not accomplishing anything and then want to go into politics? It doesn't, those two things don't go together, do they? True. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. You it's know, why we, I lose. It's why I lose. <laughs> I'm not a good politician. It's why I lose. Yes. We should we should talk a little bit about that because uh New York City politics has been uh you know oh I, my I've, God. Been, I've been very critical. I, I, I don't do all of politics, but I'll do the nutrition part yep. of it. And uh what gets me is a couple of things. Um you know, the you you know, the New York City Mayor Adams, he's got a huge um you know, he has his own health journey. He improved his health going plant based. Um, and and that's great. And I'm happy. Let, let me protect you for a second. Yeah, I'll protect you for Let me play cover. Let me give you some air cover. Yeah. He's a terrible mayor. Yes, yes, yes. We know. Now, say what you must. I've already covered you now. Go ahead. Oh, I could jump in. I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> I can say all this stuff about your mayor. So there we go. Her. Yes. So you may not know. I th I, th I think he sent the DA to, to our office. Interestingly, but I, I won't. You know, everything went great. But uh, I suspect after a viral video of him went uh, you know, went viral, I, I just got uh, two government agents who came and visited me. It's, it went perfectly fine. I mean, that's that's the beauty of doing everything electronic. You know, uh, is we have great records. So in any case, um, what was the video? You know, I, I criticized the meat policy, right? So uh, got it. Mm -hmm. he's tracking. Yeah. So, well, let's start at the beginning. You know, so what was what was the video? The video was about him tracking the meat consumption of every single New York City yep. uh, uh, person, both governmental and non-governmental. And yep. it's and he's partnered with Amex and Chase to get this done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really sort of concerning. Um, but uh, the uh, you know it started really my like my anger towards his policy came from you know when he took inner city school kids and yep. he basically said we're not gonna you know you have meatless Mondays well now you have vegan Fridays yep. and we started to see all these pictures of bags of Tostitos and you know yep. a bag of baby carrots and that was the lunch that some of these kids have and you have to understand my kids your kids are gonna be fine they're gonna have steak egg salmon they're gonna be fine. But the really poor kids, you know, the kids who don't get good meals over the weekend, yep. they are going to be ruined. And the policy is disastrous for them. I mean, it's just it saves money because they don't have to. Protein is expensive. Yep. Right. And uh, the companies are happy because now they can sell grains, you know, to make. But they get they just completely the, the work. Then what happened after he did this, it was widely embraced. I don't know why. Now, senior homes, senior homes and prisons are following suit. Which of course. Now, senior homes in New York City are are required to have at least one vegan meal, one vegan day per week. Right. And yep. the New York City schools, uh, New York City hospitals are required to serve vegan food as default. Nobody understands the reason why this is actually happening. And let me, in case your audience doesn't know, you guys probably know this, but in case your audience doesn't know, this is all because of government subsidies. That's all this is about. The government subsidizes our farmers for both soy and corn like there is no tomorrow. It throws money at them. And instead of New York, there are many farmers now who can't survive unless they grow government soy and sell it to the government. They can't survive. Like they will literally go out of business if they don't sell at least a chunk of their, they want to sell goods food, but to be able to sell good food, they've got to grow government soy and or corn and often Monsanto brand. Even they don't want to be Monsanto fan, farms. They have to be or they can't survive. So that you find farms upstate New York where it's you know 80% what they want, 20% Monsanto government corn or soy so they can survive and get the government funds. Because the government will ensure that even if you your, your crop fails, they still pay you. Doesn't matter. But there are farmers now out there who hope their crop fails because it's a lot less work for them and they still get paid. 
So they're kind of hoping the crop fails because I don't have to work. I got to fix my machines. I still got my government check. Yeah, whatever. I'm fine. They'll take whatever I got. They don't care. So as you saw subsidizing corn and soy, what does corn and soy industry have? Lobbyists with extra money. They take those, those extra dollars and their money and they come and they lobby individual people and groups and get people to believe this stuff. The average congressperson, the average gentleman is an absolute idiot. They have no idea what they're talking about. They're empty suits and or empty heads. And that's done on purpose. I've, I've debated them. They're idiots. They, don't, they have no idea what they're talking about. All they know is talking points. In fact, this is something you, you may not know. Try to find a policy team for someone running for office. You can't find one because they're not building policy. You, you might ask, Larry, why do you have so many policies? Because I can grab great policy people from all over the place because no one else has a policy team. So I can grab them and I get them for free. I get amazing smart people on my policy meetings for free because there's no place to do it. All they do is go to the lobbyist group and say, what's my policy? They say, here's money, here's your policy. And the policy is make sure that people are eating lots of corn and soy-based products to the best of your ability because that's how I make my money. And government projects are awesome because when you sell to the government, it's monopoly and it's high price and they never say no and they always pay. So why the hell would I go to the market and give them to buy my soy garbage I'm going to have the government write me a check in perpetuity ongoing at a massive uh, in increase in profits. So that's why this is actually happening. So here's the point I'm going to bring up. Most of the politicians pushing this actually don't know any better. And they honestly believe the garbage they're told. Most of the politicians actually aren't evil. They're apathetic. They're just doing what they're told. They think it's right because they get money from it. And these people are a part of some thing. So they push it like it's real. They don't know. So I, I guess I'm explaining why this is happening. It isn't like it's a massive evil plan from the evil people. It's just money. That's it. It is just money. The people who are doing it don't care about those kids you talked about on the show at all. They don't care. They don't care. They, they don't well, want to hurt the kids. Yeah, and they the same thing goes for doctors, right? The doctors are in the same boat. Right. There's like, hey, they told us this, and we just listen and go, okay, you don't think you go, what am I seeing in my practice? What am I seeing every day? And they go, what's killing people? Does this make sense? You could drink soda all day long that's addictive as you've made so clear. And then you just exercise more when you're working 50 hour weeks and you're stressed when you get home. Right. You got a kid who's sick. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it is so unreal how how far we've fallen, uh, you know, yes. as, as, as a group without thinking, going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. And that's why Tro and I sometimes get in trouble saying, does this make sense? Like, if you use common sense, does this make any sense at all? Do you think intervening one day a week and putting someone vegan, like how would people like it if I got in control? Like, okay, I'm doing Christian Tuesdays. Everyone has to pray and go to the Bible because it's good for you and it makes you happy and there's right. good stuff in there. Like you can't force all this stuff on people. So it's like, let people eat. Like the libertarian yeah, comes on, out and says, point. let people do what they want to do. If you did Christian Tuesdays, who gets paid? That's, that's the problem, right? If you do vegan Tuesdays, that means now out of a million kids in New York City, all One the schools, is, all the money. Yeah, exactly. Bingo. The food pyramid, all the stuff that we've been following. Like, that's all money. That's a lot of cash. I got to feed a million kids at least twice a day in New York City. That's a lot of money for soy and corn people. And now New York City, what else follows, right? New York City is the largest school district, uh, school uh, system in the entire country. So once you get New York City, everybody else begins to follow. That's, how, that's why they always go for New York City, because then the rest will begin to follow. And you will literally get millions upon millions of children who are doing this. And that's a whole lot of money. You're exactly correct. I, everything you're saying, yes, yes, and yes. The, the worst part is the mayor's also, if you look at his donations, he donated to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you know, I think like, which is a vegan front also. Yeah. Uh, roughly, I think it was 28 million or something like that, maybe 44 million. So, you know, they're supporting him. <laughs> He's supporting them. They're all supporting yep. the brain and, and, you know, and it's like the people are suffering. It's the, the elderly people who need that protein, you know, yes. and the young kids who need that meat, you know, and especially the poor young kids who need that meat, it, you know, it improves their IQ. It prevents stunting. It gives them nutrition. I mean, this is how you make a functional society, you know, sound nutrition. And well, it's uh, funny though. You, I talk to nutritionists. I know a lot of nutritionists. And I would talk to them and they don't get mad at me. They all think I'm stupid. They all think it won't work. They all think that. So I'd ask them a simple question and they would often like kind of scold me a bit. I never get mad, but I'd say, I have a question. I was curious. If I don't eat carbs, 
what nutrient, what vitamin, what mineral am I missing? Like, what am I not getting? And all they'll say, guaranteed, Larry, you, you understand you have to be balanced. That's the word I use all the time is balanced. I hear that word like every other day, balanced. I go, okay, great, balanced, I got you. So with my with my balanced meals, if I don't balance and I don't have carbs, what nutrient, what vitamin, what mineral am I missing? And they'll go two or three times, just like dismiss me like I'm an idiot and go, well, balance. And I'll go, please, could you just could you tell me one. And they'll say something like, well, you know, sometimes there's some B vitamins. And I say, okay, great. Could I get that B vitamin from a vegetable or from maybe an organ meat or liver or something? Is that possible? And they go, well, yeah. So then why do I need a carb? Larry, it's got to be balanced. They will not agree with me. They will just yell balanced at me, then walk away. And that happens like once a month. You're Some nutritionist choir, yells balanced. As, as long as you have Pop-Tarts, the Pop-Tart pop -tart deficiency <laughs> syndrome we see yeah. all the time, right, True. Yeah, it's the Pop-Tart <laughs> inclusionism. You have to balance the real food with Pop-Tarts and cupcakes <laughs> and ice cream. And so that'll be the balance, right? That's a balance. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. It's a, it's a so shame. Funny. But no, and, yes. and the other thing that's a shame, too, is as you bring up too the other pl the, the problem with farmers, like some people want to be organic farmers. If you're an organic farmer and you find one seed or one thing that blew on your land that said Monsanto, you're in big trouble. You're going to get the heck find out. It's going to be a so they're scared. They're like searching all the time saying, let's like if, if the wind blows, they're scared because if, if you get some of those seeds, they go, oh, you didn't pay for this. <laughs> You're infringing, uh, right? So there's so much of that where, where there's so much overreach. It's, it's, and it's scary. Your independence is really scary. There are two government policies that would affect this, right? One is at a state level, one's at a federal level. At a federal level, there should be no patents on life, period. And sadly, we do not accept that. There should be no patents on life. If it is life, there is no such thing as a patent. We should avoid that and end that period. And seeds are life. That's life. You tell me what a patent on a machine you built, on some code you, yeah, no worries. I get that. Makes totally sense, right? Some process you put together. Okay, great. But if it is life, you don't get to patent it, period. You don't get to patent puppies. You don't get to patent humans. You don't get to patent seeds or plants. And sadly, our government does not accept that. That's number one. When it comes to federal laws, there should be no patents on life, period. Number one. When it comes to a state level, if a if any farmer or small business, and I consider farmers small businesses, if any small business decides it wants to sell only within a state, it should be completely immune from all federal regulatory bodies. Wyoming does this already. New York should do it too. If New York does it, that means now if I'm a farmer and I just want to sell local, well, then I'm not, the USDA doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to me, I don't care. As long as I label everything, not USDA approved, who cares? You want to sell raw milk. You want to butcher your own meat. You want to sell at the farm stand. I don't care. You want to grow whatever corn you want to grow. What, grow it. Who cares? If people don't want to buy it, then your community puts you out of business. I'm okay with that. That's the market. That's how stuff works. But I don't want the government putting me out of business. I want the government coming down and hammering me. Right? So you you pass those two. You make those two changes in regulations. I think you'll change a lot. That will help tremendously. And no one's talking about it. I'm the only idiot talking about it. And the reason is there's no money in it for me. Again, I'm a bad politician. Look, I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, that's uh, like the same way I feel. There's no money. There's no reason for me. It's not my kids who are going to suffer. It's my, you know, n none of my family's in a New York City uh, senior home. I have nobody I know that's in a, thankfully, in a uh, uh, jail in New York City. Yep. It's, you know, I don't have any, you know, friends that are, uh that couldn't supp supplement their their income uh sorry their their food uh right. with real food and they're they, they have sufficient income to buy these things but it's it's still a travesty these are people yes you know and it's and the problem is there's there's not enough people who even when someone says it they just immediately dismiss you that's the hardest part is just being immediately dismissed when you look at it right and and i'm going to go to a point which i'm going back to government again right you cannot have an obesity epidemic without government support. It's impossible. You you cannot have. Remember this. The, remember the uh, the 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 uh, the TV show, My Six Hundred Pound Life. Yeah. There's like eight shows like that. 
that's not what this like man and the thousand pound sisters and a two thousand pound family and uh, i mean there's like eight shows how can you have in one country eight shows on people who weigh over 600 pounds how government interference two ways and i'm sorry my libertarian views i had to go politics too guys i just had to sorry uh so two two aspects number one the ada the ada that was passed the americans with disability act it was passed with the best intentions and i believe that and i believe most of the time the ada helps tremendously i do believe that it was passed with the best of intentions it was trying to help people with disabilities i get it 100 percent. they made a big error when they said if you're overweight you're disabled once they added obese to disabled list that was the end because these people are so physically big they cannot leave the bed so how do they eat so much government gives them money so they can eat on top of that government pays their friend as a caretaker that's why they always have enablers the enabler is getting paid if you get skinny i lost my job so you never getting skinny right so i have an enabler who ensures he keeps giving me all the food and you stay in bed both being paid for by the government you remember that 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 recent song that got so popular um rich men north of richmond he mentioned oh, yeah. he says if you're five foot three and over 300 pounds why am i paying for you well because you are once you can't work anymore the government's paying for you and the caretaker now again i get why they would do it if someone's elderly you, you want someone to take care of them Again, best of intentions, the ADA. Once you say someone's overweight and that's why they're disabled, you trash the ADA. You just made it worthless. You broke it. You broke the entire law that was meant for good. And that's government interference. Second piece, what's the cheapest food? Cheapest food is anything with corn or soy in it. Guaranteed. Corn, soy, cheap. Why? Government literally pays for it. Government literally pays for it. In certain cases, Corn is actually free. I'm not joking. Why do they give popcorn in, in the movie theaters? Because it's cheap. I'm not, when I say I'm not joking, the paper the popcorn comes in costs more than the popcorn inside. I'm not making that up. Do your home. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. The paper bag they put the popcorn in costs more than the popcorn in the bag. Why? Government subsidies. So it comes back to government policies. It always it, does. It, it, it's a hard thing. It, it's a hard thing because I, I remember it was a wake up call for me right when I became a doc. I went to Vietnam on a medical trip. And I was there in the rice paddies talking to these guys, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, all this stuff they went through. And these people, do they care if it's if it's uh, communism or capitalism? They just want to grow their rice and sell their rice and feed their family. And, and so 100%. that's why that song you mentioned hit so many people because they're like, look, just leave me alone. Like this yes. libertarian mindset is like, let people live and let live and don't regulate every dang thing. Like how many, how many, how many gallons of water I can have in my toilet when I flush right. it, but then you're sending all this water out to the ocean because you don't want to build containment to, to save it when we do finally get rain and all these crazy things you look at and go, my gosh, I mean, it, it, is, it gets so crazy. It's like, if you just get out of the way and let people do their thing, sometimes they can, they can be way more productive and help a lot more people. Cause I can guarantee you any church out there is going to help more people than any government program. When they say there's 100%. need in my community and I can go out and I'm going to help build stuff. And I see people who do that all the time but uh, hold on they can't though because what will happen is and this actually happened there's a guy named spike cohen who was a very popular libertarian also he has a a a, a a place called you are the power organization and he goes around finding problems like this there was a church uh was it i forgot where it was north carolina i think that was feeding people and the government came in and said no you can't feed them why because you didn't follow our rules or regulations you didn't pay us so and so and he literally went out of his way went down there made it public and he shamed the city council into just letting the church feed the people, right? In New York City, it's a true rule. The, a very common that restaurants at the end of the day used to put their food out at the back. And if you wanted food, you would grab it. End of the night. The, the New York City said, you can't do that because it doesn't pass the regulations. So what do they do? They throw it out. So what now happens? Homeless people have to go dumpster diving. No, yeah, they're eating out so the garbage cans and that's safer than just yes. getting it right? fresh and clean. Yes. It's, in, it's and, incredible. And then, Day old bread, you know, those kind of things. That yes. people, like it's, it, it is insane. So the government makes it harder. In fact, I'll go back to even childcare. If you go back 20, 30 years, churches were a very big part of where people would drop off their kids. There used to be childcare at many churches. That was a common thing. Regulate out of business. 
government puts regulations on a church can't afford it anymore, particularly in a black church, which is worse. They need it more than anybody. So you regulate them out of business. Now they can't do it anymore. So now, you, again, you're right. Community is always better than the government. But when, and government knows that. So that's why it crushes community so that it can do its job. Remember, what government does well is it just keeps you in a terrible place. Very good at that. You won't die, probably. We'll keep you right there. But you're not growing because then I lose my job. So you're going to stay right there. Community actually helps. Community actually makes you grow. You can get better with community, right? That's the whole goal. Particularly if you're a nonprofit, right? What are, who were some of the best people in nonprofits? People who used to be broken by the, the system. The nonprofit helps the person get past the system. That person becomes, uh, uh, often runs the nonprofit eventually, right? That happens all the time. Getting better is how, right? If you, have a, if you have a go to a nonprofit that's not run by government, not government grants, and they go to an event and they go, hey, you know, Dr. Tro, Dr. Brian, give us some money. What are they going to show you? They're going to show you people who were successful. This is Jane. She used to be the bad thing. Now she's the good thing. Look what we did. You go, oh my God, it's working. And you give money. What does government do? Government says, Dr. Tro, we're going to raise your taxes because we have to pay for this. I don't care if it works or not. In fact, if it doesn't work, here's the reward. We're going to give it more money until it does work. And since it's never going to work, who's going to keep giving it money? Who's going to give it money forever? It's a whole different way of this. You are completely correct. Remember, whenever you add government, you by default remove community. That's how it works. You want to make sure you're adding more and more community. I can't agree with you more. Churches, local civic groups, um, ethnic group groups together. I don't care what it is. Local groups are going to always do better than government every single time. I completely agree. And cheaper and cheaper too. And, you know, there's and a cheaper. guy I was thinking when we were talking, I was thinking about this. There's no incentive for people to get better, right? Even even Tro and I know a lot of companies, big companies out there, they, they're they just clicking a box and say, oh, we did something to help our, you know, we did the biggest loser challenge. So click, we did something to help them, even though they know it's not going to work long term. So you look at this, there's a guy in Arizona uh, that I've been following and he does uh, like uh, nursing homes, basically, like 10 mm -hmm. group homes. But he has people yeah, that come in. Yeah, great we'll get him on the podcast. He's a great guy, right? Yeah. Hal. Hi, Hal. Uh, you know, he's doing great work, but the thing is, he's taking people who are 500, 600 pounds that can't walk on their own. And he says, okay, we're going to do physical therapy. We're going to get you on a good nutrition plan. We're gonna... And people walk out of there. And now they have a life. Now they can contribute to society and not be a burden to society anymore. Yes. But there's no incentive for that. He doesn't get paid more for doing that. Because it's easier just to lock people up in there. You know, seniors locked up in the room. So he has people come in bed bound. And they walk out the door and go back home. So it's hurting his business because he'll he has to bring in more people to replenish those people that, are, that would be lifelong customers. And you know, they die one day and you ship them out and you get the next one in to, until they die. And so it is amazing how much if we intervene, but you don't get paid for that. You yes. know, you get paid That's to not be successful. And yes. in medicine is the same thing. The sicker your patient is, the more you get paid all the time. It's it's a it's such a conflict of interest, it's it's unreal. It's the break fix model, right? I I I use it, I, I compare it often to how it used to be the tech world. The tech world finally changed. If you go back 10, 50 years of tech world, it was always the break fix model, right? Um, you have a problem in your office. When you have a problem, great. I'll now come fix it. I'll charge you per hour. I make money when your stuff doesn't work. Well, crazy how your stuff never worked, right? Because <laughs> I always made money. It just never worked. Finally, somebody figured out and said, wait a minute, I don't like this. I'm going to go to a monthly model where you pay me per month, depending on how many computers you have. And it's a flat fee. And it's in my best interest to never come see you which means I need to make sure your stuff's working so I can never come see you. Just collect your X thousand dollars or hundred bucks every month and your stuff's always working. The model changed, the incentive changed, so the service got better. That's how it works, right? Now there's an incentive for me to make sure your office is always running smooth and you never call me. That is now my incentive. We need to have a, a medical system that's like that, that it's, is set up to where you pay monthly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're yes, working on it. It's direct primary care. That's what we're doing right now. Because I like my interest is to keep my patient healthy and living as long as they can and enjoying my Correct. company. And and I have to provide a service. So if you're stuck somewhere and they have ten thousand extra patients, they don't they go get out of here. We don't care. So we have to survive. So we have to provide good care. So it, it is. Yes. And and I know if I invest two hours in you today, you're not going to be using me all the time. Because if you get it and you want to be healthier, you do better. Right. If we well, educate this, people the right way. It's crazy. There's something else, though, that people aren't getting. And it's because government runs healthcare. And again, I always go back to government. That's why I'm libertarian. Government runs healthcare. And if government didn't run healthcare, and in today's world, and you guys are seeing it, 
I talk about you that troll all the time. I I say I, I promote your stuff. I'm talking about this. I'm going to promote this. Why? You're not my primary hair care, uh, health doctor. I don't have one, right? But I'm doing it anyway. Why? Because I respect what you're doing. So I'm still going to promote you regardless whether I use you or not. And that's the glory. And if you if you are a good doctor and people care about what you're doing and they want to support you, they're going to support you either way. They're going to tell their friends, listen to what this guy's talking about. This guy's smart. Uh, but Larry, I live in Connecticut. So what? You travel and see him once in a while. Otherwise, watch his stuff. Support this guy. He's brilliant. Do that. And I think you're exactly right. If we move that model, being a good doctor is not just being good primary care physician. Obviously, it is. But it's also showing people how to not have to come to see the doctor. Right? That's You want to be shown. Here's how you don't come see me. Right? Listen to me now. You don't have to come see me unless it's a catastrophic incident. Then come see me. But if it's not a catastrophic incident, here's how we deal with this issue. And I think more people are seeing that. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I, we've been such hot, big proponents of uh, you got to put the patient first. Uh, the interests have to be aligned. You know, pay me to keep you healthy. Pay me, yes. You know, for the time and the quality I spend in t with you. Don't pay me, you know, for visits. Don't pay me. It's not. It's not going to work like that. You yeah. know, it's not going to help like that. And we've been passionate about that for for five years now. You know, and there's been people in this field, and you know, we've talked to. Uh, Dr. Horowitz in New Jersey, who's been doing this 15 years, you know, uh, so there's been a whole frontier uh, of DPC doctors. And I think most of care needs to go that way. You know, we need to go put the consumer in the empowerment seat, the patient yes. needs to be empowered, and the value has got to be proven. So I'm, yes. I'm, this, is, this has got me goosebumps. And I think you're right, Larry, we could be talking here for hours and you were right before we started. You're like, this is going to go six hours, but this is, this is about all. So let me, let me pop two things before we get off. Two, if you don't mind. One, I just had on a doctor, Dr. Nikki Johnson. I had her on my podcast about two weeks ago. Um, she is a proponent of direct care. She talks about, she have a whole bunch of details on how the federal government has crushed doctors, has crushed hospitals. She's amazing, very savvy. She's part of my policy team because she knows what she's talking about in this regard. She discusses how, how Obamacare, how some of those laws in Obamacare crushed hospitals. Doctors cannot own hospitals anymore. So it made sure that only you know big banks can own hospitals, things like that. So interesting person, you might wanna have her on or talk, whatever, she's great at that, that's number one. Number two, I tell a story often. We're creating a two-tiered system in America and people aren't getting it. The two-tiered system is the wealthy use private doctors. The best doctors don't take insurance anymore. That's happening more and more. I see it in New York City. It's going to cross the country. Try to find a doctor who takes Medicare, Medicaid. Great. You'll see your doctor in six months. You see a doctor in three months. You see a doctor in three weeks. That's how that works. Now, I've used both, right? I've used both. When I have a real problem, I go to a, regular, I go to a, a private doctor. When I need to check up, I go to whatever the doctor is local. I don't care. I'm just getting a piece of paper, right? So I don't care, right? So I do that, right? But the point is I've done the both. When you go to a doctor who takes Medicare, Medicaid, you, your appointment's at three o'clock. You get seen at 445. You get seen for maybe five minutes. And it always ends with either a procedure, a prescription, or a test. Every time it ends with one of those three. Why? That's how he gets paid. Why do you get seen so late? Because he has to stack up people so he gets paid because Medicare pays him garbage. So he has to make sure he stacks up six people in every hour. Otherwise, he can't, he can't get paid. You go to his waiting room. His waiting room is a hunk of garbage. Why? Because you're not really the, the customer. The customer is the government or the insurance company. You're just in the way. So I give you the bare minimum in, in my office. My receptionists <clears throat> care more about photocopying information than you. And as one doctor and as four administrators. Now go to a, a private doctor. There's four doctors, one administrator. Put reversed. Not just that, when you walk into the place, your appointment's at three, you get seen at maybe 305. Maybe, probably three, maybe 305. And then that talks to you. He, he, yeah, maybe 305, Prime but probably three. Three, yes. mine, 305. There we go, yes, that's something, maybe 305, right? But you get seen, and then that doctor talks to you. He asks you questions like, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? What's your stress level? He asks you those questions, right? And he doesn't have to give you a prescription. You go to a doctor who's Medicaid, he gives you a prescription for aspirin. He gives you a prescription for Tylenol. He gives you a prescription for that. Why? He's paid. That's why he does it. 
right? So we use a prescription for that. Now, if you go to a private doctor, he doesn't have to give you any of that. Why? You swiped your credit card or wrote a check. He's already paid. He doesn't have to get the test or the prescription or the procedure. Not required. So he's only going to give you that if he thinks you actually need it. The entire thing has changed. Wealthy people go to private doctors. This is why wealthy people always say Medicare for all is a great idea. Why? They don't actually mean Medicare for all. They mean Medicare for them. That's what they actually mean. They're not losing their doctors. They're not yeah, doing that. Yeah, and the point is, you know, it's like telling everyone, hey, I could get you the cheapest flights ever. You get a cheap flight, but you have to wait in line and there's only one plane. Good luck. Correct. Yes. That's what's yes. happening. Like people can't, yeah. that's what I had to struggle with for 18 years ago. How do I get all my people in that need to be seen and still at some point go home and see my family? Now, us three talking here, what people don't realize, number one, uh, uh, you know, we had the highest suicide rate in the history of our country last year in 2022. Yes. Number one is ex-military like you. Number two yep. is doctors like me and Tro, two a day. Yep. And people yep. don't realize that it's the pressure and stress and worry. And, and plus, you're not effective anymore. You know, when you're yes. dealing with that, I mean, I gave a talk recently and I had eight doctors surrounding me in tears saying, how do I get out? I can't take it anymore. Yep. You know, and they're the smartest of the smart and the best of the best. And the problem is they, they care. If they were a robot, they wouldn't be asking me the question. They go, I'll just fumble through for 40 years and get my money and go home. Yep. You know, Dr. Nikki and I were talking about that in the podcast. She brings it up also. Yes. The change in how that works and how there was a time when if you were a doctor, you went out of your way to make your kid a doctor. Now the reverse is true. Not a, they're like, don't be a doctor. Don't you dare go to law school. Don't go to, go to yeah. medical school. Don't do it. I oh told my God. My, my kids to learn uh, database and data analysis. That's what I said. Yes, exactly. Yes, you know, like, exactly. Yes. My, although my youngest son said, Dad, I want to work with you. So we'll see. Maybe we got. Oh, one. that's great. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Hey, Larry, tell, tell me about your. I, I got to find Nikki now. So tell me your, your podcast and how people get in touch with you if they want to support you or follow you. I am Larry Sharp on everything. I'm on all the things. Larry Sharp YouTube, Larry Sharp Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Larry Sharp Facebook, Larry Sharp Parlor, Larry Sharp Tribal, Larry Sharp Insert the Thing. Larry Sharp is there. It's Sharp with an E and the E stands for entertaining. So yeah, so um, just as long as it's Larry Sharp with an E, I'm everywhere. I do a, a podcast at least three or four times a week, usually uh, Monday nights at 9 p.m. I do a panel show. I do an interview show usually Wednesday to Thursdays, and I do an actual terrestrial radio show out of Rochester, New York, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Everything I do is live. If you want to reach out to me, you always can, either via chat or via phone on my 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 phone. My um, radio show on Tuesdays is a call in. You just call and talk to me. So I'm very active. I, cr I travel New York State every single year. I go to every single county, all 62, every year. I've been doing it now for six years. So you probably can see me if you want to stop by your county in New York State. I'll be in every county. I'm going off again uh, September 16th. I'm heading up to the southern tier. I'll be up in uh, Tyoe County and counties like that in that area, Shimong, those areas. Larry, you got to call me so we could do like a local meetup or like a local, maybe we could do like a, you know, you said you needed some help exercising. So we could do a 5K for charity. Oh, or I like something. that. You know, we could do something like that, Larry. I'm in. I love that. I haven't run a 5K in a while, but I can still do one. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you, Brian. As always, it's a pleasure. Look, I got to ask one more question before we stop. Just, just for like, just quick, Larry. Libertarianism. Why is it yep. not caught on more in the United States? Why do people just stick with the R and the D? And uh, libertarians, like people, say that's a throwaway vote. Why is that? Because the system, the system ensures the left-right paradigm works like there's no tomorrow. Right now, literally, you cannot get on a ballot on most states in most states in the country. New York State, I got on the ballot in 2018 and in 2020, they'll just change the rules to make me not be able to get on the ballot. So literally, they make it to where you I cannot be on a ballot so you can't see me, so you can't vote for me. They literally use rules to block me. I actually sued the state last year eight times, four times in state court, four times in federal court, lost every time, including three appeals. They literally do not want me on the ballot at all. They fight to keep me off the ballot so that you don't have a choice, number one. Number two, the left-right paradigm works. As long as I am yelling other guy bad, I don't have to fix anything. So if I lean left, I just go, Republicans are evil, Trump is bad, you got to vote for me or the Republicans are going to kill everybody. If I lean right, Democrats are evil, they're going to kill your kids, just make sure that you vote for me and I'll protect you from that. Meanwhile, nothing gets changed. And I mean that specifically because look at the issues we've been working on right now. Immigration. Why haven't we fixed immigration? 
20 years, no one can figure it out? Of course they can. They don't want to. They Homelessness, want to. drug problems, Homelessness, all these drug things. issues. There's you money. can't fix these yeah. issues? <laughs> Abortion. You can't fix this? Right? So I'll ask an important question. If you lean right, when the Republicans ran everything, why didn't they fix immigration? Why would they? Now you get to vote on it. If you lean left, when, when Obama ran everything, why didn't, why didn't he codify Roe versus Wade and fix abortion? Why? Well, because then he can't run on it. They never fix anything of any problem. And, and I know someone's going to say, well, I'm Republican, Democrats are worse. No, they're all bad. Well, I'm a Democrat, Republicans are worse. No, they're all bad. It doesn't change well, anything. I'm going to give everyone a free civics lesson. I was at, in my old practice in San Diego, and I had a very liberal guy politician coming in a very conservative coming in and i realized they were scheduled back to back with each other and i was like oh my gosh these guys might kill each other in the hallway right so i have the liberal guy and i'm talking i go hey what do you think and i named two conservative great love him he's a great guy we have wine like twice a week we go out to dinner and i yes. talked to the, the the super conservative guy and asked him about these liberal guys on the other side oh love them they're super nice we go out to dinner we hang out i'm like okay so i think i understand I'm paying for you guys' dinner and wine and you guys are having a good old time, but you fight it out during the day like MMA and then you guys go hug each other at night. 100%. I'm paying for that. <laughs> it's okay. not actually I think left I understand versus what's right. happening. It's actually elite versus the rest of us. That's there the is. reality. That's yeah, the I think one. that's what I think what that's what we've all versus learned. the rest of us. In Two medicine, everywhere you go, it's the same. It's the elites versus the rest of it. And it's amazing to, to think about it and how many people will sacrifice themselves to protect the elites. It's really amazing. 100%. Yes, again, and it's again. not about being successful and making money. That's not the point. It's about being an no. elite. It's different. Yes, <laughs> that's why some of them they'll batter, even if they seem to be like, "Well, you're making money, yeah, but you're not really one of us." So we got to kick you to the curb, right? You really got to be one of us. I can. It's the elites versus all of us. And so I hope that at least answers your question. That's absolutely that's the thank why you. It doesn't work. I appreciate that. Yeah, because I think that's a, it's a, it's all about the money. Ultimately, it's like who's going to get the funding, and when the other guys do stuff, we raise money, and then. <laughs> You know, it's like we're gonna get there and fix it. So it's still a problem. You guys have had, you know, five years and you haven't done anything. So it is Nothing. frustrating. So so direct primary care tro is the answer to all of our ills. Guys, like I have to head out. Larry, as always, I didn't realize how close you are, so we're gonna get together. Uh I'll shoot you a DM with my with my cell phone. I might okay. even visit New York to see Larry. I might That'd I might be amazing. Even risk it. Throw it all, throw my it. dice and do it. So awesome. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate this talk. And Larry, you raised so many good issues and so many important points for our patients. So we appreciate your time. 100%. Good talking to you. And Troy, you weren't that bad either.